Hi, this is Mark Birch with a quick revision of John Donne's selected poems. Hi, today I'm going to be taking a look at a nocturnal upon St. Lucy's Day being the shortest day of the year. And in terms of the context, we need to appreciate that a nocturnal is a poem of the night. It's an appropriate form in which to explore the emotions associated with the death of a loved one, as is the case here. St. Lucy's Day was December the 13th the date of the winter solstice and in the Julian calendar of the time, the shortest day of the year, therefore the darkest. And it's also worth recognising that Lucy is a cognate of the Latin lux, meaning light, uh, which is perhaps ironic given the context. In terms of St Lucy herself, um, it's a pretty sad affair. Um, there were a couple of myths surrounding her canonization. Uh, the first is that she was killed as part of the Diocletian uh, persecution of Christians. She's traditionally associated with vision or light, as one of the myths associated with her canonization is that she had her eyes gouged out as part of the torture designed to make her confess her Christianity. Another myth even more bizarre, perhaps, is that um, she had a suitor who was attracted to her eyes. And so in order to avoid his attentions, she gouged them out and presented them to him on a plate. While the specific date of the production of this poem isn't known, many critics claim that it was written in 1617, this year being significant in a number of ways that could inform a reading of the poem. The first is that Lucy Countess of Bedford, Dunn's patroness, became seriously ill. You may remember her from Twickenham Garden. Secondly, Lucy, Dunn's daughter, died. And thirdly, and most importantly, not the year of her death, but recently, Anne Moore, Dunn's wife, had died. So let's take a look at the poem itself. It's quite a long one, so I'm going to divide this up into two parts. Tis the year's midnight. And tis the day's Lucy's, who scarce seven hours herself unmasks. The sun is spent, and now his flasks send forth light squibs, no constant rays. The world's whole sap is sunk, the general balm the hydroptic earth hath drunk. Wither as to the bed's feet life is shrunk, dead and interred. Yet all these seem to laugh, compared with me, who am their epitaph. Study me then, you who shall love us be, at the next world, that is, at the next spring, for I am every dead thing, in whom love wrought new alchemy. For his art did express a quintessence even from nothingness, from dull privations and lean emptiness, he ruined me, and I am re-begot of absence, darkness, death, things which are not. All others from all things draw all that's good, life, soul, form, spirit, whence they being have. I, by love's limbeck, am the grave of all that's nothing. Oft a flood have we two wept, and so drowned the whole world us two. Oft did we grow to be two chaoses when we did show care to aught else, and often absences withdrew our souls and made us carcasses. But I am, by her death, which word wrongs her, of the first nothing the elixir grown. Were I a man, that I were one, I needs must know. I should prefer if I were any beast, some ends, some means, yea, plants, yea, stones detest and love. All, all some properties invest. If I an ordinary nothing were, a shadow, a light and body must be here. But I am none, nor will my son renew. You lovers for whose sake the lesser son at this time to the goat is run to fetch new lust and give it you, enjoy your summer all. Since she enjoys her long night's festival, let me prepare towards her, and let me call this hour her vigil and her eve, since this both the year's and the day's deep midnight is. Dunn begins the poem by temporarily locating himself at the darkest point in the year. It's the figurative midnight of the year, given that it's the winter solstice, and it's literally midnight on this darkest of days. Dunn also uses ellipsis in the first line, omitting the second use of the word midnight. Tis the year's midnight and tis the day's midnight. And that could represent the poem's focus on absence and loss. Here, 
the noun itself is absent. The reference to Lucy's alludes to the title St Lucy's Day, again the shortest day of the year. Light is personified as Lucy, the saint who's symbolically associated with light. When she removes her mask, she sheds light, but on this dark day, the unmasking of light lasts for a mere seven hours. The frequent use of sibilance may represent the poet's despair as he spits out the references to the absence in his life. The absence is conveyed through the pathetic fallacy of night, an absence of light. And less convincingly, the poem could be regarded as a commentary on the loss of faith, perhaps created by the loss of loved ones. In this sense, Christ, the light of the world, is symbolically overshadowed by the darkness of grief. And the sibilant sounds could represent the serpent in the Garden of Eden, a symbol of temptation and loss, in this case, loss of faith with God. Dunn personifies the sun as exhausted or spent. All that remains of the light are stars, his flasks. And when Dunn refers to flasks, he's probably referring to military powder horns, devices that were used to contain gunpowder in preparation for charging a musket. So it has that sense of retaining something, something that's going to be associated with light. In the same way that a musket's got to be filled with gunpowder, so the stars were believed to be filled with the light of the sun during the course of the day. And the conceit of the muskets extended through the reference to light squibs. Squibs were an Elizabethan military term that related to half charges. Um, a squib could also denote a firework, but either denotation works within the context, given that the half charge and the firework both provide a brief source of light. And it's that brevity that's important here. We still idiomatically refer to the squib within the phrase damp squib, something that fails to impress. The metaphor here conveys the way in which the star's light is weak, reinforced by the claim that they admit no constant rays. So on this dark day, the darkest of days, even those sources of light that remain are incredibly weak sources of light. Dunn presents the world as devoid of its energy and life force, what he refers to as its sap. And once again, sibilance could be used here in order to convey something phonologically. In this case, perhaps the poetic voice's bitterness. It could also represent the liquid sap that's been drawn back into the earth as you have that kind of phonological representation of liquidity. The metaphor of the Earth's life force being lost is extended across the following lines. The Earth has drunk the general balm. And balms were generally perceived to be healing lotions, and here Dunn could be referring to the life-preserving qualities of the Earth's sap. Essentially, the life of the Earth has withered away. Hydroptics are referenced to suffering from dropsy, uh, not an illness that we're particularly familiar with nowadays, but it would be appropriate medically as it's associated with water collecting beneath the skin in the same way that Dunn describes the sap sink sinking beneath the world. Um, Dunn uses the word hydroptic as well to suggest dehydration and a world that's diseased. Wither is an adverb that can be used to denote a place. The poetic voice considers where life has shrunk to, whither has it gone. But Dunn also appears to be punning, given the homophonic link to whither, meaning to become dry and shriveled, something that's entirely appropriate within the context of the hydroptic earth. Dunn uses the simile as to the bed's feet to illustrate where life has shrunk to. And this could be a reference to a bed of flowers maintaining this conceit of nature. And in this sense, life has descended to the root of the flower bed. There's no visible life. Perhaps a more convincing interpretation may be that this is a reference to a literal bed. Elizabethans believed that life left the body by descending through the physical form, and hence on the deathbed, life shrinks to the foot of the bed. After this series of descriptions of decay and loss of vitality, Dunn states that these things are dead and interred, reinforcing the finality with a caesura. 
despite establishing that the world is dead, he feels mocked by these dead things, for they, even the dead things, seem so much more vital than he himself. He employs the hyperbole of being the epitaph of dead things. He's the summation of all that is dead. By metaphorically identifying himself with their epitaph, he renders himself not only lifeless, but something that's never lived. Again, the structure complements the sense of finality, with epitaph placed as the last word of the last line of the stanza. OK, and we'll leave that there ready for the second stanza. So I hope you can join me for that and uh, take care. Cheers. Bye.